Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Tom Daly. I'm the owner of Zoop Eateries and Tasty Dog, uh, chair of the Tom Daly Foundation, a member of the CMC Board of Trustees, and a member and past chair of the board at COSI as well. Uh, I'd like to recognize today's sponsor, uh, the Robert Weiler Company, and then, uh, this sounds a bit self-serving, but the Tommy Daly Foundation as well. Uh, so. <laughs> And today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. <laughs> Has science literacy ever been more important to Ohio than now? The return of the COSI Science Festival, which begins today and lasts through Saturday, is showcasing Ohio's commitment to science literacy. Science literacy is critical to growing Ohio's economy. It's even a social determinant of health. Consider the value of being able to read and understand a drug label or take basic measures to protect one's health. Companies like Intel will be relying on Ohio increasingly to turn out legions of young people excited about science. And so today, very timely, we will explore the very high stakes of science literacy and education in Ohio with our speakers. And I'd like to introduce our speakers now. Uh, first is Dr. Frederick Bertley, President and CEO of COSI. Dr. Burley, I have to have to gloat here for a second. I had the honor of hiring Dr. Burley to come to Columbus, so uh, maybe one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, Lou Von Thayer, President and CEO of Battelle, and Joanna Pinkerton, President and CEO of Coda, and our host here on the side, Angela Ann, uh, news anchor with WBNS 10 TV. Welcome, Angela. Welcome, to everyone. Uh, you'll learn more about today's speaker in your flyers, and now I'd like to turn it over to Angela, and we look forward to today's conversation. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much. Good afternoon, friends. This is wonderful and amazing. I can tell you we are in for just a fabulous conversation already. So let's get right to it, because there is a lot to talk about especially when it comes to science, and as we saw the critical role that it played in the past two years with the pandemic, but for some people, perhaps a divisive role as well. So my first question to our guests tonight, today, what hour am I in? I woke up at 1 a.m., hold on, okay, here we go. What does it mean to be science literate? Dr. B, I'll start with you. <laughs> It works. Clearly, I'm not science literate with that one. <laughs> um, first of all, that's a great question. And the first thing I want to say is it has nothing to do officially with formal education. So being science literate doesn't mean you need a undergrad in a science field, a master's degree, or a PhD. Obviously, if you have those, you'll probably be science literate. But more importantly, it's just the concept of when you think of reading and writing, right? No one expects you to be Maya Angelou or William Shakespeare, but you're still supposed to be able to read and write. Similarly with, with money, you know, if you go to a store and you buy something, you're expected to be able to count, to be numerate, right? No one expects you to be Albert Einstein or Benjamin Banneker, but they still expect you to have a facility with counting. And for some reason, much of the Western society has decided that that doesn't apply for science. It's okay to be science literate, unfortunately, in this country. And some people even wear it as a badge of honor. You know, oh, I'm not a science person. I, I fell out of love with math at grade three or, or grade eight. And so the concept of science literacy is just to get the community to feel much more comfortable on asking scientific questions and having some understanding of how some things work. And so it's not about a specific expertise, but it's about recognizing the value of understanding scientific thought, scientific methods, which are basically ask questions, know how to do research, know how to navigate through the data that you've researched, and then form informed decisions. And you see what happens. You talked about the pandemic. I mean, Clearly, science illiteracy is part of the problem we had with getting out of this pandemic mm -hmm. um, as fast or slow as we did. Sure. Lou, I'm curious because you are surrounded by scientists at Battelle, so your perspective. Yeah, I think my perspective is very similar. I might take it a little bit further. I mean, I think being scientific lit or science literate is to be curious and then be able to put facts around how you develop your opinions. Not necessarily what you read on a Facebook post, not necessarily with some politician or some uh, producer of a product trying to sell you, but can you do your own thought process and evaluation? And, and it just comes down to basic things like, you know, if you're going to 
charge something on that credit card you know you can't pay back? Do you have the understanding of compounded interest and what it's going to cost uh, you to go through that, to be able to read medicine label? Uh, just some of, I don't think you don't have to be an engineer to do this, but to have basic understandings so the world can't fool you easily, so you can at least be an, an intelligent subscriber of the information. And I think it's so important for our society to, to have more of that. Sure, sure. Um, if you didn't notice, Joanna kind of smirked when you said you don't have to be an engineer to say this, because she is an engineer. <laughs> but Joanna, what does it mean to you when people say you need to be science literate? That you need to be an engineer, get your degree. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Well, this is like the easiest speaking gig ever, because like Frederick just like lays it out, and then Lou takes it to a whole other level. So I, I don't know that there's anything I can add to the fact that it's a mindset except that it's about being creative. So Frederick articulated there's three steps, three protocols to being a scientist, but it doesn't mean that you're wearing a white lab coat. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're in a room by yourself studying something under a microscope. You have to be willing to be creative and to drill it down to what Lou was referring to about awareness and understanding to make your own decisions. Like we all exist in a natural environment or a built environment. And every one of you is sitting on something that was built by science and the clothes on your back, the food you consume today. And just that curiosity and the creativity to say, this came from something and there was a process in a, in a system that brought it to me, as opposed to just being you know, tunnel vision and I do this one thing every day. So to me, it's really um, acknowledging that creativity is part of the process. Mm -hmm. So glad to hear the acknowledgement that you don't have to have a degree to do it. Um, and I'll also say you don't have to be Einstein, I think you said, you don't have to be Marie Curie, you don't have to be Catherine Thompson, you don't have to be Jerry Mock, it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. it, it, it transcends race, gender, ethnicity, it's about being creative and curious. And I think in the past two years, we have seen with the pandemic, when it first started, all we heard in the beginning, follow the science, follow the science, and this is why we're doing what we need to do to get over COVID, whatever getting over looks like. And for all of us the last two years, we've been upside down, sideways, inside out. It has felt like that to all of us. Where do you all feel Ohio stands today in terms of our science literacy in the state? Has it improved, declined? Do you think fewer people trust science? I just throw them out there. I mean, this is we're real talk today. Oh, we're going in order, so I get to go first? <laughs> Great. Well, you can I'm rock, paper, totally scissors. duck this question and you yeah. two can handle it. Here, here's how I'm going to answer it, um, and I'm literally going to duck it. I can't speak to the literacy of the whole state, but what I can say is the resources in this state for science and engineering are unparalleled. Not because he's sitting next to me, but just so you all know, Battelle is the number one research non-for-profit research institution in the world. And it's in this yes. state. Then you got that small little university that sucks all the oxygen out of the universe called OSU from, and actually, Dean, where, is Dean Harrison still here? It is, right? So we have our former dean of the School of Engineering, and not just School of Engineering, the School of Science, et cetera. Phenomenal powerhouse, but it's not just OSU. You have Otterbein, then you have Denison Capital, and I hate when I do this because I know I forget some. You have Columbus State, et cetera. You have about 25 to 50 universities, powerhouse colleges and universities right here teaching STEM. And then, of course, you got the number one science museum in the nation by USA Today three years plug, ago. Plug, plug. But really, so there is an embarrassment. There's, a, there's an embarrassment of riches from a STEM education and STEM experience. Shout out to Girl Scout over there with her new, Tammy Wharton, with their new STEM initiative they're doing. Um, yeah. Just there's so many great resources. So we have great resources. Now I'll let them answer what's the state of science hmm. literacy in the state. <laughs> yeah, of course you I'll, will. I'll try to further duck the question with, uh, uh, you know, what I, what I would say I think is very true, that I think the state is, is well positioned with the resources we have and the attention that we're putting to it. Um, you know, Patel, we were impacting about 100,000 students a year five years ago. We set a goal to get to a million students a year and continue to do that every year. We're going to hit that this year. So you see, and, and we're one of many, right? We're one of um, AEP's got programs. Uh, the Girl Scouts we just talked about, we celebrated that yesterday. So I think we have lots of resources. And I actually, 
You know, I give our governor and state pretty good marks for how we went through this because we're not immune. We are split politically just like every other place. Our big cities have the same struggles that every other big city has. Uh, you know, we don't look that different than the rest of the country. But, but I think our leadership did manage to step up and really follow the science. And the science changed as we learned more, right? We started out, and I always try to put myself back in what we knew and didn't know back when it first started. And, you know, the first cruise ship that came in, people were taking samples that had been out in the sun for two weeks and said, oh my God, it's still active. And there was one set of rules that went with that knowledge and those knowledges we had in the early days. And as we learned more, and as we got more more, you saw the rules develop, and of course we saw the politics also build during those times. But I think it's also important to remember that uh, in new things, science isn't a fixed point. And, and even in old things, sometimes it's not. I mean, all the, you know, when I went to high school, I learned about electrons, protons, and neutrons. We thought that was everything, right? And now we know about quarks and neurons and neutrinos and, and all these other things that we just hadn't figured out yet. And I think we also have to give ourselves the understanding that in just about every place, we're going to continue to learn more. And your ability to take the data and what the data tells you, rather than your emotions, rather than, than somebody else's opinion, is I think what makes a difference between a science-driven thought process and a politically or emotionally driven thought process. Joanna, you want to duck out this question or you want to match? I'm sure my government affairs team in the corner wants me to duck. <laughs> but I'm not going to because I'm going to speak about this as a mother Great. and also a student of the public school system in southern rural Appalachian, Ohio, and someone who's had a career um, and had the ability to, to maturate to a different place in life in central Ohio because central Ohio and my parents and my mentors gave me that opportunity. Um, what I, I like, you said it very sophisticated, Lou, but I love what Frederick said about we have an embarrassment of assets in this community, what a wonderful thing, right? How blessed are we? But it's all about access. So there's, you know, there's roughly 61 really rural counties in this community. So Lou's commitment to go from 100,000 to a million, his program is in my son's school in Southern Ohio. And it's making a difference for kids who are on free or reduced lunch. I know that about it. So it's all about access. I do think that um, we are uh, relying too heavily on philanthropic, nonprofits, and I think each of us has a responsibility to, and it, it's not about what is my kid learning at school, it's about are we teaching critical thinking skills. Uh, I sat on a, a foundation in Southern Ohio seated by the Columbus Foundation, so think about that. Columbus decided to give money to Southern Ohio, and we chose to spend ours on STEM education. We have coding K through 12 in six different rural school systems who struggle to keep the lights on, but yet a, you know, a school in this community here where we sit today has plenty of resources and access. But changing our mindset that it's for everyone, everyone can do it, small upfront investment, I think is a really important thing moving forward. Um, I don't, because I don't see an equity right now in the distribution of assets of people thinking that science is for them. It's really about access. Well, and I think that's a great segue into um, my next kind of category of question is about that accessibility, but also, you know, our future generations and how do we make sure that this, this movement of science and STEM sticks? Because we have science teachers out here, I know we do, and as a mother of a nine-year-old girl who loves everything about science, I want that to continue, not just through high school and college, but beyond. So, you know, you talked about the roadblocks, Joanna, um, in the rural counties. How do we know efforts like what Kosai is doing, the, the learning lunchbox that you just gave out? How do we know those efforts are working? I mean, that's a great question, and it gets back to, to funding and people stepping up. Um, if you want to have programs, intervention or exposure programs, you have to be able to measure it. Cool thing about science is we take measurement seriously. And so you have to, whatever the program is, what are your metrics, what are your goals, and then how are you going to measure those? In the case of our Learning Lunchbox, we got a robust program that has um, both feedback from parents or th feedback from parents, teachers, and kiddos who are using the kits to see, you know, their understanding of science has it increased. Their comfort with wanting to learn about science has that increased. And we do it through a whole suite of demographics. So everything from higher end, um, really wealthy communities to underserved zip codes in both rural and, and city areas. But fundamentally, I, I think you nailed it, Joanna, and, and thank you for doing a deeper dive in these questions. You know, accessibility is everything. And what kills me in this great country, the greatest country in the world, is when we look at the sports model, 
everybody has accessibility. If you look at OSU and you look at what the football team looks like, if you look at if you start going to the professional leagues and you look what all these teams look like, you know, hockey, right? Not a lot of African Americans. The lion's share of the American kids who play, because there's a lot of European athletes, of course, but the lion's share of the, the American folks who play in the NHL, they didn't come from affluent communities. Some of them did, but there's a lot of poor zip codes that are represented in the NHL, NBA, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. My point is, we figured out accessibility for sports so that anybody who has talent or interest can prosper there. We haven't done the same in the sciences. And genius knows no color, no race, no gender. There are brilliant people in the LGBT community, mm -hmm. brilliant people in black and brown communities, et cetera. And so we gotta make sure everybody has access to that so we as a society will benefit. The more bright people, or more, even if it's not bright, more interested people in science, it will help us be sure. better as a society. So amen to bring up accessibility and thank you for, for wanting to, to continue that conversation. Lou, do you see roadblocks out there in accessibility and, and you know, yeah, I, I, I'm encouraged. Uh, at the same time, it's still a huge challenge. Uh, I, I think as parents, you know, we all need to demand more out of our public schools. Um, you know, we, we, we make significant investments and, and we continue to see performance going down. And I, and I think we tend to see the performance going, having the most challenges in the most, um, not necessarily economically challenged, but the most diverse schools because you know, we adjust school levels and we adjust funding levels, but we don't always get that piece back out. And where I'm encouraged is, for us, it's, it's finding people, as we're doing hiring, that have the skills. And we're finding more and more minorities that have the skill sets that we can hire. And we're watching those numbers, not as fast as we like, but we're watching those numbers come up over the years. But I, but I think it's really a measure of, um, I, in fact, Tammy's team helped me uh, learn some very important things over the last three years of working with them. And you know, by nine years old, most girls will decide if they're going to be interested in, in a STEM or science-based career or not. And I do think we're making progress because the fact that we're even having this discussion now, and I think back a decade or so ago, and you were a nerd if you liked math and science, and our whole society was set up, um, you know, TikTok dances would be today's version or, or basketball versus these kinds of things. And I do see that swinging, uh, which is, is I find, um, it makes me optimistic, but I think we just have so much work to do. Plus that, if we want to continue to be a nation that has a continual raised standard of living, we are going to need more scientists and engineers. And we have a shortage today. Uh, we've been producing a shortage for the last decade, and, and somehow we've got to turn those demographics. And the only way to really do that is we have to hit all of our populations. We can't assume it's going to come out of one group. Uh, we, it's got to come from every corner of America, every part of our society. And uh, you know, part of our passion and part of what we've, we've focused on at our company is trying to make sure that every kid has a chance to at least see what that could look like at those young ages. And then they can decide what they want to do as they get older. But find a way to see and spur that curiosity and then hopefully build more tools for them to, to make those decisions as they build across. So I want to ask each of you maybe to come up with that one great idea, right? If money was no object and you, know, you had nothing holding you back, how do we turn the tide? Because I'm going to give out some numbers and and this is pretty startling. I'm glad there's hope, but this surprised me. Studies show women make up 34% of the STEM workforce, even less when you talk about specific fields. So 26% in computer and math sciences, and only 16% in engineering. So the question really is how? If you had endless buckets of money, endless resources, whatever, tell our audience that one great idea that you could say, this will do it. And I'll start with jo <laughs> Joanna's like, how many hands do I have that I can hold up? Go ahead, girl. I know I have to keep it short. So you said one, so I'm gonna throw it out there. We need coding in K through 12. Every one of us in this room, I presume, knows how to speak English, whether it was your first language or second language. It's taught in all 13 years in school. And the fact that we all operate in a digital environment and we have no control whatsoever of how to even reset our phone. So why aren't we teaching digital literacy just like we teach, you know, it, it's, it's it astounding to me. And this is not expensive at all, but it fundamentally makes it part of your society. It's just, it's just expected. Um, and I'll give you a, a really interesting example that struck me um, when I worked with the foundation to get coding in rural schools. Um, so my son goes to a relatively rural school, but we're pretty well resourced because of partners like Battelle and COSI Visits. Um, 
so I helped host open house. And when you are working in schools that do not have resources and parents are struggling to even get their kid to school, open house, you know, I take the day off work, I drive my kid to open house and it, you know, you're there, right? And I've watched a, a young woman walk in with her mother and it didn't look like they had two nip, nickels to rub together. And um, I was helping with the coding and robotics class. And I said, would you like to look in here? And the mom said, well, I think it's maybe like what typewriting was for me, honey. You know, why don't you check it out? Hmm. And that was real, you know, that was a real thing for them. And we all learned how to use a keyboard. So why don't we, why don't we, why don't we all learn to code yeah. starting in kindergarten? And not make it a scary thing, right? I mean, I know my daughter loves Scratch. To me, it's a scary thing, but she's like, look, mom, I can make this ball bounce here, here, and here. But when it becomes part of their everyday language, that's when the light bulb goes on. All right, Lou, you're one big idea. Yeah, so I would go down a similar path, but with um, science K through 12. And I know we have that, but I don't mean a science teacher who's got a teaching degree and, and isn't a, you know, in, in supplementing those capabilities actually find ways to bring in programs where real scientists, real inventors, and they can do hands-on work, uh, shoot off rockets, play with chemicals, do the kind of things that uh, Frederick's going to have the city doing this weekend. But I, I think try to do things at the very early ages to capture that curiosity and make it just raw fun. And then how do we build on it over time? But again, I don't think it, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money. We uh, we all are working on philanthropic programs to try to make those things happen. But if we can capture that curiosity, we can overcome a lot of the societal disadvantages. Fantastic. Dr. B. I'm going to cheat and say two, but one's real quick. Give every single kiddo in the United States a COSI lifetime membership. <laughs> Shameless plug. Bingo. Um, the second one, I'm telling you right now, might be a little uncomfortable or, or gauche, but I, I'm just I'm going to keep it real about accessibility. If every politician and every one of us in this room and every one of upper middle class folks were forced to send their kiddo to an urban or rural public school that's not performing, in five years we'll have a different outcome. Because the fact of the matter is, this country knows how to educate. This country knows how to educate in STEM. We have top performing schools in the city, whether it's CSG, whether it's Columbus Academy, whether it's St. Charles, whether it's what have you. We have it across the country. We have Exeter. You know, we have all these fantastic schools that teach these kids to make them amazing scientists and engineers, but they're accessible to 5% or 10%. So if we really want to solve the problem, we know how to do it. Imagine all of us had to send our kids to high schools in Linden. No, not trying to throw shade on Lyndon or Frank, but you get where I'm going with this, right? And so if we democratized public education, um, and public and private education, so it really was a fair playing field, again, there's genius everywhere, right? Why, why wouldn't we want all kids to have access to phenomenal education resources? Why do you have to pay high taxes or live in a really affluent area to access a good public school? So that's my not popular, but I'm, I'm data driven. I know it would work. But you know what? That's why we're here, right? Because we need these conversations to be out there. And then when you go to your back to your business or your community, have these conversations and tell them what, what you heard. I love that because what we're talking about is equity. It's so different than equality. It's equity. Like, and, and I'll just add, this applies to myself too. I mean, we had our daughter in public school in early on. And then, you know, and we're very much into that. But then we saw what was happening. We're like, you don't want to experiment on your child. So we're like, whoop, put her in, put her in private school, right? And so I, I want to be clear. I, I am part of the problem too. But as a collective, if we really, see, if we're really serious, we want to do that. I think it'll make a big difference. We'll talk. I'm going to give um, all of us some time to talk about the science festival because I think that it is part of the solution, right? Making it accessible for people everywhere to come and enjoy science. But we have to talk about a little company called Intel <laughs> coming to. Central Ohio, but it's pretty huge. And what's exciting is I, I, I don't know if you guys felt it, but there was a swell of excitement with Intel and this major chip maker coming to here. And then the questions that kids were asking, well, why? And what's a chip? And what does it do? And it sparks that curiosity. So um, Joanna and Lou, I'm gonna start with you guys to talk a little bit about what Intel coming to Central Ohio means to Battelle, means to CODA, means to this whole science literacy that we're talking about. I, I think it's awesome. Uh, it's going to come with challenges and opportunities as, as they grow and build jobs out. And I know initially they only have 3,000 long-term jobs, but if you really look at what's going to happen, they're going to have 
tens if not hundreds of partners move into town. As an, as an ecosystem builds, you're gonna see them build that facility out. You're gonna see other producers come to this area because we have talent, because we have capacity, because we have all these items. And that's gonna be, it gives, I think, this community an opportunity to do something that I'm not sure any community in the country has ever had. Most, com most cities, as they grow, you can go to Austin or Atlanta, pick, pick your poison. Um, they've all gone through, they went through these rapid growth spurts like we're having now, and they screwed it up. Now, I don't know if, I don't know if it's possible to not screw it up, but we're going to give it a try. We're going to try. Here, and we're going to <laughs> give it a real try here, and we're all working on it together very hard. But they live in gridlock now, and they still have these great business communities they built, but their quality of life has probably gone down dramatically. They didn't have the opportunity. They expected that growth was going to happen, but they didn't know it was. Well, we know it's coming, right? The train is coming. It's on the tracks. We can see the beginning of the headlight, and it's going to be here before we know it. So we can actually be bold and brave in our planning, and we're not taking risk like you would if you were trying to do it, assuming that the companies come in years from now. Uh, for Battelle, I think they're going to be a new partner for us. We already work with them in other parts of the country, and I think we're going to see opportunities to expand that relationship and, and build out. And anything that can build the ecosystem, we educate. You know, our colleges here are great. Um, we got to get more of our kids into the colleges, and we educate. But so many of those kids in the industries that Battelle plays in get their degrees, and they go to the coast. And you know we need another attractor to keep them here. So I, I really look forward to that. I think the bigger ecosystem we can build here, uh, the more opportunity it's going to give, and the better the better it's going to be for the community in the long run. Joanna, well, I like the word ecosystem that Lou built or used because Ohio's been through this before. It wasn't a digital company, you know. It wasn't the next generation technology maybe at that time. But whether it's aviation, rail, chemicals. Um, we have been through this, but it's our generational opportunity. Like we, we have case studies of cities that used to be 12,000 and now they're like 300,000. And we are over a million people in this region. We are the largest city in the state. We had all of the population growth in a single decade. So the resources are here in the acknowledgement that you have to continue building the ecosystem. If you've been here for more than 10 years, and you can look at what the skyline or what the community looked like, it's changed a lot in 10 years. Imagine that 2x, 3x over the next 10 years. So it's a catalyst, but it has to force us to think about, like we know how to do this, we've been through it before, engineering and trades have always been here, but it's time to skill up. Mm -hmm. It's really a catalyst to skill up. I'm, I'm gonna plug public coding. <laughs> coding K through 12 and public transportation. Um, we have to think differently. You cannot do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. And that's what the, you know, the other cities did. Um, it is going to put a strain on public infrastructure. Well, we can figure it out. I know we can. We're smart people. Um, so the most important thing is to acknowledge this catalyst is here and take advantage of it. Perfect. So let's talk about the COSI Science Festival. Yummy, right? Um, this morning, all morning long, I kept calling it the COSI Big Science Festival, and finally, after like three times, my producer said, Angela, there's no big. It's just the science festival. I said, but it is big. You're the largest STEM event in Ohio, one of the largest in the country. So I'm going to rebrand your festival as the big science festival, which kicks off today. Right. Why not? But honestly, Dr. B, this science festival, first of all, is back in, in person after three years. Here, here. That's exciting. Yes. It's kind of like science literacy on steroids. I mean, this is just the event of the year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, thank you for that, and by all means, rebrand it. Now, to give you a little credit, there is a big in one of the terms. So Saturday is the big science celebration. Oh, good. So that may be where you got it from. Never but trust we, when we you... We should call it the big science yeah. um, festival. <laughs> um, so, so some background here, and you touched on some of the data. By 2020, which was two years ago, greater than 50% of the jobs in this great nation, 5-0, greater than 5-0, are STEM-related. And we're not talking about masters and PhDs. We're talking about even a two-year community college degree in coding or some other tech. So over half of the jobs available are STEM-related. So you want to maximize the people's population 
interested in that. And we know from the science of literacy and, and all the data out there that not 50% of the population is super excited about science. It just, it just isn't. And so the concept of the science festival is really to open people's eyes and get them to feel comfortable around science. Don't think of it as just for these really, you know, thick glassed lab, lab coat wearing people in ivory, you know, towers of, of education, but that it's in your everyday neighborhood. It's in your church, your synagogue, your bar, wherever you're hanging out. And so that's why the first three days are intentionally not at COSI. They are in your communities, in your backyards, where you live, learn, and lounge. Because when you have a science experience in your everyday life, it's more meaningful to you. It's one thing to go to the Battelle lab if you can get in. Um, you, <laughs> you guys now know Lou, so you might be able to. But normally you can't access the Battelle lab, you can't access the, the College of Engineering, the great labs at OSU. You, know. um, you can go to COSI, which is great, but you can't go to a lot of these places, right? And so it seems foreign. But if you have a science experience in your house, or in your backyard, or in your church, community center, et cetera, you're like, wait a minute, it's part of my everyday life. And so that's the spirit of it, making it engaging and getting you to feel comfortable where you are comfortable in your world. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday, of course, is the big science celebration where we do bring Battelle, OSU, OU, you name it, all the big companies, CAS, if you're in this room, uh, about 120 different tents slash companies, for-profit, non-profit, around COSI so you can engage. And the key is we all do hands-on experiences because we've learned that you don't want to read another flyer about why it's important to look for a Battelle job. You know, doing a hands-on experience, having that robotic arm, controlling that, or putting two chemicals together and getting that change in front of you. That gets you excited. And then you start to think, wait a minute, maybe the science stuff is for me. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do it. And it's now rebranded the COSI Big, Big. Science Festival. <laughs> I love it. And I love that phrase, live, <clears throat> learn, and lounge. I mean, doesn't that just make learning sound so exciting? Because you can lounge while you learn. We so. do a lot of lounging at COSI. My, my team is here. They will tell you that. We do. And I'm going to use that line. Hey, I know Lou. Can I get in? I'm going to go to the second thing in the open door. Um, Lou Patel is one of the, the biggest partners for the Science Festival. Tell me why, on a personal level, it's so important for you to be involved. Uh, this is one of those easy buttons. Uh, when you're a science company and you're trying to build the next generation and get people excited about science and you have the Energizer Bunny um, <laughs> coming from Philadelphia and, and wanting to take something they've done at the Franklin Institute, which is a great, also a great uh, place, and, and build it out here and actually take it to the community, uh, it was pretty easy to say yes. And we, have I think, have 90 volunteers, last account I saw from Battelle, that are so excited about this that they come out every year and there's nothing like seeing the kids' faces when something happens in front of them they didn't expect and the, those wonders and awe. And uh, so this is really the easy button for us. It's, it's important to us. It's, I've, I've told Frederick, you know, we're partners for life. Uh, not, only, not only the personal friendship, but the, uh, but the fact that our interests are so well aligned with these types of activities that uh, we're just honored to be part of it. That's great. And I know Coda, you, uh, Coda is such a great partner as well because um, Coda is offering rides to the festival at no cost That's to right. the customer. So that goes right to your accessibility. That's right. I, well, to Lou's point, when Frederick asks, the answer just has to be yes. But I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad that in the very first year he asked. Yes. Um, because what we stand for is um, equity and sustainability in our community. Uh, like I said, we have some challenges ahead in our community that come to growth, whether it's housing affordability, workforce, uh, creating the next generation of scientists and movement. Uh, you're going to be stuck in traffic if we don't do something right. You know, like we don't want to be hot Atlanta. We want to be Columbus. And um, so Frederick approaches and what can we do? How we, can we tie it in? And how can we get people to understand that 90% of the jobs at my organization of 1,100 people are technical in nature? Even an operator is operating a million dollar computer on wheels. Think about that. A million dollar computer on wheels. Um, so we said absolutely yes, and I'm excited because he's challenging us. Um, if, you, if all you have to do is tell the operator where you're going, it's no charge because we wanna make sure that kids and a parent or maybe a grandparent who wouldn't otherwise go just feels comfortable getting there. Um, and right now, we, pa we pass out a paper pass. You have this little token. It's pretty cool. It's got your logo. I like that. But um, it's challenging us to think about digital literacy. How do we code COSI directly into transit so that when you, when you bought or were given your pass to go to the, the science festival or to go to COSI, it's your automatic pass to board on transit. So there's just no barrier. Um, so it just makes sense to partner with people who are already, you know, working on the same vein 
of changing how a business operates. Absolutely. We are going to take some questions from the audience, so if you have questions for our panel, you know what to do. There's a microphone there in the middle of the room, and we're going to have some from live stream. But honestly, I can just picture all three of them when they were maybe seven in a room together. Dr. B saying, let's blow this up. And Joanna saying, no, but that doesn't work based on my engineering brain. And Lou saying, let me get my scientists on it. And he calls his buddies down in the dirt, you know, back in the playground. But thank you. I mean, honestly, what did you guys think? This was an amazing conversation about science <laughs> literacy. And hopefully we will move that needle to get the science illiteracy out. Right. I think that made sense. All right, Doug Buchanan, I know we have some questions probably coming in from the live stream. So um, if you're watching online, by the way, friends, please type in your questions. There's a chat. And take it away, Doug. Angela, thank you very much. Thank you to today's fantastic panelists. This is a, a terrific conversation. Thank you. Uh, our first question is from the live stream audience. It's from Dave Dittmars with Critical Advantage Corporation. Dave asks, what support is available for STEM programs in charter schools? What local collaborations are there between STEM high schools and tech firms for internships and similar real world learning experiences? I, I can start. Okay. So, so I think there are a number of opportunities. Um, Ohio was one of the first states to actually establish a STEM school designation. And it started with the Metro School that Patel started 16 years ago. There are, I believe, eight schools statewide now. And there are resources actually through the community for that support. As far as charter schools, and so those don't really count as charter schools, but they act like charter schools. They're, they operate separately from the public school system. Uh, and if you look at places like Patel and actually many other, other foundations, um, we'll hold competitions each year for people to bring their ideas on how they can you know, have the best ideas and, and impact the most students, and, and we'll fund those things. And, and so do many of the foundations in town. So I think there's a variety of avenues to go to, to find the potential for those resources. And, and I know, you know at Patel, we get everything from um, Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops to uh, to 4-H elements to uh, you know schools around the state that um, have a unique idea. And what we try to do is is really figure out which programs work. Then we try to expand those and, and let them help grow those across to impact more kids. And I'll just add, um, Ohio has a rich network called the Ohio STEM Network, where if yeah. you're a school K through 12, you can join that public, private, or um, charter, um, and then there are other great institutions. I mean, we talked about Girl Scouts, there's a past foundation, obviously COSI. There's so many resources out there that offer, and this is critical, free programming for, for kids in the K through 12 space, um, whether it's coding, um, which we need more of, um, or, or engineering or just general science. So there are a lot of resources out there, but the key is you gotta look for it. You know, I'm, you go, go to, you can go to, I would go to the Ohio STEM Network, um, but also go to any one of our institutions here and the ones you've heard. There's a lot of programs available our leader of that sitting at the table right over there so he can help you. <laughs> I'll add uh, a bit about workforce. So those programs through philanthropic or nonprofit, um, the workforce development programs developed under this state administration, so that's one arm, and then your local school system can um, match funds together so that at a workforce level, uh, employers can get in the game. So you're talking about inside the halls of the school uh, we do it outside the hall halls of the school. We are an example, but many employers do this. I partner with the school. I use workforce development funds. Teenagers are inside our facility learning trades, learning coding, learning all of the technical aspects of mobility. Don't worry, they're not driving any of the vehicles. <laughs> but um, they, they are paid an internship, and it's part of their curricula. So that's really new, just kind of in the last two or three years. So I would encourage you to check out workforce funds as well. Fred, Fred, you need them. Uh, I'm passionate about holograms. And my question uh, goes back to something that Lou had spoken of, uh, talking about the decline in performance in, in the education. And, but it seems to me that there, are, I, I'm asking what are the goals and the measurements that are being used there? Because we know, or at least my understanding, is that a lot of the current curriculum is directed towards meeting certain tests and being able to qualify on those tests and as opposed to a general approach to learning and literacy and science and so on. So 
perhaps any suggestions as to how that structure uh, might be developed to produce higher performances? So me personally, I would probably have to go to somebody on my team that understands this better because I'm not an educator as far as those specifics. But, but I would say from where I speak of is our rankings worldwide on how uh, U.S. students have compared against European and other students. And we've seen for the last 40 years that our rankings have not gone up. They, they continue to, to struggle. So I do think what we're doing, you know, back to the definition of insanity, it's time to question some of the things that we've been doing because uh, it's not like we're putting resources in. It's not like we don't care. We definitely have equity issues and other things that we need to solve. But, but fundamentally, um, there, there's some things that just aren't giving us the results we want. I'd like to reinforce the critical thinking and creative components. Uh, I'm not going to touch on the standardized testing and all the stuff my son's going through right now. But for me personally, and then also what I see, especially with young girls, it's that early age that Lou mentioned early, like under age nine, teaching people how to think not what to think, because whatever curricula you put them through later in life, they're still going to embrace that with that critical thinking. So I, I do see an absence of that. I had that in my early childhood, and God bless it. I mean, that set me on an entirely different trajectory. I did not see that introduced to my sons in public school. Um, so they get it at home over the dinner table, and they don't like it, but it, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can just add, um, first of all, Fred, thank you for your question. Second of all, great first name. Um, so um, I, I really want to unpack some of what Lou talked about because it's so important to your question. We talk about you know diminishing standards and, and performance dropping, and it's true. And the exams that he was referring to, these international competitions, there's two of them. One is called TIMS, T-I-M-M-S. The second one's called PISA, P-I-S-A. And what they do is they look at countries all around the world, and there's a math section, English, et cetera, but there's a math section, and then a science section. And what you hear year after year is America in math is performing 29 out of 40 countries tested. In science, it's 33 or 35 out of 40. We're way below in dropping. However, when you analyze the data in detail and you look at the zip codes and you look at the schools, America does something different than a bunch of other countries. We aggregate all our students. So all the students in this great country are taking the test. But the top American students are performing one two or three in the world. And many years, we're number one. So if you're going to those top schools, you know, CSG, I want to leave one out, St. Charles, et cetera, you all know the schools, they're performing really high. It's just we're not doing a great job at the other schools. And unfortunately, about 90% of the American population goes to these underperforming public schools. So it's not that we don't know how to educate. It's that we got to shift priorities to try to elevate these poor resource um, communities. Great analysis. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Lemingshuk with CareSource. I've thought long and hard about this question. So, Frederick, who's your favorite Marvel character and why? <laughs> <laughs> that is not a plant, but thank you so much. So, clearly, I'm doing a shameless plug for Kosai. I'm wearing my, my uh, communications and marketing team have taught me well to stay on brand. So, we do have the Marvel exhibit. It's fantastic. My favorite one is Spider-Man. I was raised in Canada. We had two channels at lunch. I'd come home, myself and my brother, and we'd watch um, Fred Flintstones from 12 to 12.30 and Spider-Man from 12.30 to, to, to 1. And so I fell in love with Peter Parker. I really do have a, a science question I wanted to ask, and that is uh, it's essential for kids to get the science and learn. And it concerns me in this day and age that science is under the gun by certain people and agendas. When we have the data and the scientific data, yet there are deniers out there on science. Uh, an example I'm thinking of is global warming and climate. How do we convince the population and our youth that science is essential and, and the way we have to go to grow as a society? I'll go real quick and you guys can jump in. My favorite quote, or one of my favorite all-time quotes is by Neil deGrasse Tyson. So the cool thing about science is it's true whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> and so, you know, so trying to explain to people about climate change, et cetera, it comes back to what Lou said earlier, teaching people to be, but actually both of them said it, um, raising kids, we're born curious, maintaining that curiosity, allowing us or teaching us to be critical thinkers so we can ask questions and learn to navigate the data and examine the data and you'll come to your own conclusions and you'll realize, you know, climate change is a real thing. And the other last thing, I know I said short, but real quick, um, this whole idea of, oh, there's two sides to every story. Like you always hear that, oh, there's some scientists that say climate change is not a thing. 
Just because there's somebody that says something to the other side does not mean it's a balanced conversation. 99% of scientists say climate change is real. You can find somebody out there that might say that same thing with vaccines. It doesn't mean that, oh, one scientist said it, so it's like, you know, understand the law of averages, et cetera. But I punt to my colleagues. Yep, ditto. I, yeah, you got it. <laughs> But you know what, to be honest, I think that that goes to our whole conversation today, science literacy, right? You don't have to have the lab coat, you don't have to have the degree, but you have to understand the critical thinking behind why that 1% is saying climate change isn't real, and then the 99% would say, well, go stand in front of a glacier for 10 years and go see what happens. So, all right, our next question, please. Yeah, hi, my name is Steve Gravenkamper, I'm a psychologist, and my question is, um, when I think about young people, I think about career aspirations, What's possible? Curious, is this a possible career path? And then secondly, I think about career self-efficacy. Can I do this? Is this our path to me? And a couple of the programs that you described to me sound very exciting. The coding, the touch a million people, some of the programs. What makes you optimistic or, or, or how are you kind of moving kind of young people's what's possible for me and gee, I, I think I can do this? I, I gotta tell you, I grew up in a pretty rural community with uh, my dad was the first in the family to ever graduate high school. I was the first to go to college. I paid my own way throughout and never thought the life I had was possible. Uh, so I'm a living example of, um, and there's so many others. And uh, you know, I, I, I think if, if we encourage our kids and give them the tools, I still go to spend a lot of time at colleges. I'm a trustee at OSU. I've worked at my alma mater and other places. And despite all the talk about how terrible it think everything is getting, every new college class I meet is smarter than the one I met before. So there's still a lot of good things happening, and there's a lot of bright and brilliant kids that are making it through the system. So I, I just think, again, we have to keep, we just have to keep pounding away at this, and then we have to teach our kids to think so they don't get distracted by the noise. Well, I'd like to take what Lou said at the very beginning, uh, from 100,000 to a million, like that's quite a commitment of a company like his. And so equity and access, so that message is not getting to girls, okay? I'm just gonna say it. If you think it is, then you're, you've never been a nine-year-old girl. So we've got to make sure that we're 10Xing that message and getting it into people's hands because it, the resources are there, it's good stuff. I'm with Lou, I, don't, I think it's a positive trajectory, I don't think it's negative. You just have to put it in front of young people because they, they grasp it. It's us that hold them back. And so if you are uh, in this room and you're thinking, well, what, do I, what can I do about this? There is someone in your life under the age of 10 and make sure you're changing the conversation. Please don't tell her how cute she looks today and tell him to go climb a tree. Let kids be curious, equalize the playing field, and, and be an advocate. You can do this, it's really easy. You don't have to be a teacher, you don't have to you know, be part of the science system, but change your behaviors and how you treat other people, especially those younger ones. And I'll just add, um, and this is a huge shout out and kudos to CMC for this panel. This panel was held 10 years ago, certainly 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Just say it, there'll be three old white men up here. We have Joanna, she's running a transportation company, but she's an engineer. What a role model. I'm a person of color, another role model, and then a great engineer who is now transforming the world by being part of one of the best companies ever. And so having diversity of imaging, the role models are critical. We have a program called the Color of Science, shout out to Vanessa for running it. It's just that all scientists aren't old men or engineers aren't old men with thick glasses and pocket protectors, but women make fantastic scientists and engineers and so do people of color. So just showing people that they can be that. I mean, if you ever wonder why you ask the average the you know, I'm African-American, the average African-American kid, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be a basketball player, a rapper. Well, why is that? Because all the images they see on TV or the majority of the images they see are of African-Americans dripping a basketball, throwing a football, or rapping and dancing. Nothing wrong with sports. I'm a huge sports fan, and I love hip-hop, so I'm not disparaging those careers. I'm just saying, if they also saw a whole bunch of Joanna Pinkertons or a whole bunch of Frederick Bertleys or a whole bunch of people at COSI who are looking like them coming from different communities and seeing it every day, not as a one-off panel discussion or, you know, one time, once a year, but seeing it all the time, just like they're seeing the basketball players and, and musicians and entertainers, that would have a big impact as well. Here, here, representation, right? <laughs> Love it. Joanna, you chuckled though. You don't want to see a whole bunch of Joanna Pinkertons all over the place? <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> Not at all. Our next question, please. Hi, I'm Bill Offiet. I'm an economist. Um, I think this question is dovetailing off my former student Jeff's question. 
Uh, one of the really annoying things that I hear from the crowd that doesn't necessarily believe in science is the CDC said this two months ago. Now they're saying that. They've changed their mind. They don't know what they're talking about. And so I'm not going to listen to them at all. How do you, how do you combat something like that? <laughs> this is near and dear to my heart. And, and the first thing when it comes to, let's say, science deniers is we scientists are part of the problem, and we need to own that. We speak in a vocabulary often that's, you know, hoity-toity, that five other people around the world in your field understand, and we think that makes us smarter. The first thing is everybody, if they have a question, you have to acknowledge your question and meet them where they're at. You can't disparage people because of saying this or that. That's one. And then two, it's also important to understand that as we, if you understand what science is, you would know that's okay. See, some people confuse science with a book of facts. That is not science. Science is a process by which you ask questions, experiment, collect data, and the more data you have, you get closer and closer to the truth. It, this pandemic has been such an amazing microscope experiment because in our lifetimes, we've never experienced needing to study science in real time to get us out of grave danger, i.e. dying from a bad virus. And so what was happening is the scientists are collecting data. And yeah, on Tuesday they said, this is what we think. By next Tuesday or next month, they got more data. Now we know, oh, it's this. So first it's wear masks, don't wear masks. And so the problem is, this is my, you know, I, on the one hand, don't think I'm disparaging folks who are questioning. I understand why the average person is questioning, because they look to science as a bunch of definitive experts and you can't waffle. But they're misunderstanding the process, and if they better understand mm -hmm. more science literacy, the more they understand it, it's not about that fact, right? I mean, remember 5,000 years ago, the fact was the Earth was flat. That was a reasonable, natural assumption based on the data. But with more data, we realize this, well, most of us realize this round, but. <laughs> so yeah, so it's just, it's understanding what science is about. It's not an exact, an exact fact. And so if you can kind of have a conversation with people to understand the process by which these scientists are moving the needle and slightly changing what they know, it's because of the accumulation of data that gets them hopefully closer to the natural truth. Thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Two more questions. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. All right. Hello. Thank you guys so much. This was awesome. Um, my name is Tanina Seagraves. I work with uh, Franklin County Children's Services, but I have a parent question. Um, so I have a nine going on 10 year old boy um, of color, of course, and he is in love with science, right? We live at COSI. I'm very familiar with COSI, but um, I love that I, I try to keep, you know, science in front of him, but it gets really expensive, right? Um, because we're not upper class and I do have to like make things stretch to make sure that science is in front of him. What are your suggestions for parents like me who want to make sure he still um, can pursue his interest and still be in love with science um, continuing on, um, but it's not always feasible mm -hmm. financially? Boy, that's a tough one. So there was a time in my life when I made less money than it cost to put my kids in daycare and floated all that debt. So I hear you. And I always made a commitment to have one membership a year. And so then it's unlimited, right? Like I found a way, and for me, usually it was, for a couple years it was COSI, and then it was also Franklin Park Conservatory. So you may not think of like Franklin Park Conservatory as a science museum like you do um, COSI, but like I referenced about the natural environment and the built environment, it's all around us. So get yourself also, you know, internet's so great, right? Like just stay half a step ahead of them <laughs> and you still look smart. And you know, the butterflies are part of science and so in parks. So places that may not be accessible because of a financial barrier, um, I think you can find it, but you have to start the conversation with them and then don't give up when they're like 14 to 19 and they ignore you all the time. Um, but for me, that was my personal experience with raising two <clears throat> young boys on a really limited budget and just saying, you know, it's kind of everywhere. I mean, and we talk, even when we, um, we would go places together, we would look at things like, why is that broken? Or we'd, you know, we would walk a lot, like make everything about, make every experience about science. You don't have to have an expensive lab. Yeah, I would also add that um, the internet's great. 
And, you know, I, I age myself, but, uh, you know, it used to be I had to keep the manual for all the stuff around the house. When it broke, I'd have to go dig through the manual, and all I do now is go to YouTube, and I find somebody showing me how to, you know, look a little smarter than I do. But, but I think when you look at interesting places and you search those areas, there's a lot of things that are out there that are, that are free today that are very interesting. And I think as a parent, you can kind of be the, the guider and the, the filter <laughs> on which ones are interesting and which ones you want to steer them away from. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, first of all, I commend you on, on yeah. wanting to do this. So, so well done on that. And, and I will say this, we talked about access to resources and we need to do a lot of work kind of systemically. But the good news is on a one-to-one -one basis, so you're kind of one parent, one boy, there actually are a ton of programs. So COSI, the zoo, the conservatory, which I agree is absolutely STEM, um, the, obviously the Girl Scouts, um, the PASS Foundation. There's a lot, just in this region, there are a lot of institutions that have my favorite four-letter word after Fred is free. <laughs> free programs. So, that, so while we need to have a lot more resources for all of us in society, um, and we can chat after, there's so many different programs. So if he doesn't like our program, there's so many different programs that are available for free that will really continue his curiosity, sustain his curiosity and get him to the next level. And then I agree with Lou. I mean, today there's so much good stuff on YouTube that you can watch stuff that's tailored to your interest. I wish we had more time to get all the questions in from our audience and our live stream audience. So thank you all very much. Uh, but I do want to turn it back over to Tom Daly because we want to be mindful of your time. So Tom, take it away. I'm going to take my water. <laughs> thank you, Angela. Well, I hope you found today's forum enlightening, energizing, and optimistic that while we have a lot of big challenges ahead of us in the Columbus region, we have the DNA to rise to the challenge because that's the Columbus way. Please make plans to join us next Wednesday for another interesting forum. This one is, is Columbus an age-friendly city? Uh, with a great panel of experts. Thanks again to today's sponsors, uh, the Robert Weiler Company and Tommy Daly Foundation. Tom Daly. <laughs> <laughs> Just reading a script. <laughs> and thank you very much to our online virtual seat patrons and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in, in uh, partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. And of course, please join me in thanking our, uh, expressing appreciation to today's speakers, Frederick Bertley, Lou Von Thayer, Joanna Pinkerton, and our fabulous host, uh, Angela Ann from, from WVN. Thank you all for joining us. We could not do this without you, literally. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Have a great day.